can't show centuries. Like you get the point. He's spent centuries time looping back to learn more and more things that they could do right so he can find the perfect way to do it. And why is he doing this? It's because he loves his friends and he understands the value of all the people on the timeline that he was once a part of because he goes back to that interview room, that interrogation room with Mobius, and he's talking about purpose. I, I'm realizing how good it is now. I, I knew it was good. It's yeah, even yeah, better. Yeah. <laughs> um, Hello there. Don't have a good day. Have a great day. Talk to me, Goose. Precious. You steal the Declaration of Independence. Why so simple? World. I could do this all day. Are you watching closely? Welcome, everybody, to the One-Eyed Film Podcast. I'm your host, Seth Mossberg, and today we're talking about Loki with Zach. Kind of an impromptu one because the Loki finale just came out two weeks ago by the time you guys were listening to this. But spoilers for that if you want to see that before listening to this. But there are a lot of interesting things that came up. I had fallen off the Marvel train. I kept up with news but didn't really care about what happened anymore. And then both you, Zach, and Isaac were pushing me like, this is actually really good. And I was like, yeah, yeah, okay. And then I binged it all in one day. So oh, nice. uh, yeah, it was it was interesting to have that come out the i watched all of them the day the finale released so i watched all six episodes back to back to back and then I think about two three days later i went and saw the marvels okay. and had a fun time <laughs> breaking that apart because it's pretty it's it, well it was the worst opening to any marvel movie so far in their history which is good to know but it was just kind of a, a lame movie and so it was really weird having all the commentary on loki being this is best thing marvel's done in phase four and five it's it's wholesome and it's emotional and it makes sense and it's not bad and then going and watching marvel and being like nothing's really changed at the same time they're not the same production it's not like there's a curse so it's not that valid to be like loki's bringing marvel back the marvels is bringing marvel to the ground it's not really fair to make that comparison because they were two very different projects but at the same time it's good that loki was good so that we can have some good content for once and not just have the marvels level content if you know what i mean yeah. did you even watch the marvels yet <laughs> i haven't i'm waiting for disney plus i mean i'm mildly interested it looks like a fun movie at least mm. i don't know <laughs> it's fun to make fun of i'll leave it at that okay i'd like to catch up on i'd like to watch miss marvel before i see it too because i've heard that's kind of important to watch beforehand but... yeah yes and no it's a whole thing okay <laughs> anyways what were your what were your thoughts going through loki you watched it week by week i watched it all yeah, at once we're... what did you think yeah. over those six weeks of watching it it was good yeah i mean kind of as you said with the decline of Marvel, I was kind of skeptical if they were going to be able to pull off another great season of this. But especially, you know, with since season two's got a different director than the first season. Mm -hmm. And with that and just the decline that's kind of been happening with Marvel, I was definitely skeptic. But I mean, they pulled it off like really, really well. I think one of the biggest things that this show does a lot better than most recent MCU shows and movies, I would say, is side characters. Loki's okay. got great side characters. Especially in, like, season two. You know, you've just got scenes with, like, Mobius and Obi talking. And I feel like in a lot of other Marvel shows, when you've just got side characters talking, you're just waiting to get back to Falcon or Wanda or whoever. But watching these scenes with, like, Mobius and Obi, it's like, you know, they've connected you with these characters and you actually, like, enjoy watching these just small character moments instead mm -hmm. of just waiting for them to get back to Loki. Yeah, they put value in those for sure. I would say I I've heard both sides of the story. I I want to I want to give the the haters the light of day, but also understanding that it's not the greatest thing they've ever made. It's just really good, especially compared to what we've gotten in the last 5 years. One video I saw from a hater as one would call it is when we cut to Mobius on a jet ski and thinking and everyone's like woo he finally got his jet ski dream whatever woo and that was the most exciting part that was a little over the top i understand that that was an important character point but it also became way too important for certain people as i watched reactions of it not to say that that inclusion was a bad thing but i think fans are getting the wrong things sometimes the the ones who really really love marvel and and 
think that the Marvels is pretty good and all the rest of the stuff, Quantumania is pretty good. Like they think that th- their standard for a good story is so much lower and yet the story still exceeds that. So I want to, <laughs> I just want to have an accurate view that sometimes they use, they use, the director used not the wrong thing, but the right thing in the wrong way sometimes. So yes, we got that side character depth. But sometimes there's a little too much importance put on it. It is the show about Loki and his friends and partners are important. But I I, I want to make sure that we're not just praising all the side characters when Loki is who we're here to talk about and watch. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, and and it was it was a lot about Loki. Not so much about Sylvie this time, but she is technically a Loki variant. It was just enough fan service to make me realize it was still Marvel and nothing has really? really changed. They just did it better. Mm. They did the fan service better than just tokenism as a the is the term that most people have been using of just using them as as tokens like here here's your prize here's your prize for watching so besides the fan service that could get annoying if you looked at it one way it was not actually that bad because it was used well is it just that i mean to push back on that a little bit i think i would say the jet ski is more than just fan service i think it was interesting to see like you know, every time he mentioned a jet ski in season one, it was kind of like because he had a he had a glimmer of what his life was before he was taken by the TVA. And I think that's was just very interesting to see in retrospect. I'm going to keep going with my cons, just my, my nitpicky stuff. And then we're going to and then we can talk about the good stuff. We okay. Talk about bad stuff first <laughs> and then you lighten the mood with the good stuff. Okay. Um, I still don't like Jonathan Major's portrayal of Kang the Conqueror. And I know this is a really? th- the third the third variant he's that's a hot not, take. I, I know and part of it is because he's he's a good actor yeah i don't like what he does with the characters the first one was in loki season one and he was being overly goofy and he's doing the oh, oh. and even you see this in the in the last episode of him being overly goofy that is weird to me i know it's supposed to be prideful like you can't touch me and all of that but the the most dangerous one was in Quantumania, and that movie was Quantumania. <laughs> oh yeah, this, this, <laughs> that the at least was he had, a bigger problem than his performance. But yeah, he that was probably the most Kang like we've seen him. That I would mm. choose to direct a Kang character. This one is not Kang the Conqueror. I understand that, but it's still annoying to me. Mm. <laughs> I didn't like his stutter, and I'm not saying that's ableist or anything. It's just tough knowing that. If they continue with the Kang Dynasty thing, that two out of the three Kangs we've seen are kind of lame in my eyes. That's my hot take. Mm. It's more annoying. And I'm not necessarily saying he's doing a bad job. He's taking an approach to it that is his way. It doesn't work with me. You can rebuke that if you want. Well, I don't know. I think it's just kind of the thing about having a kind of as to going into the multiverse, just seeing all these diverse versions of the same character. Multiverse, multiverse. I... The- <laughs> okay, the multiverse can be done really well. I mean, we saw that. <laughs> we saw, I mean, we, you know, we got the Spider-Verse movies that really we did. excel with the multiverse. Do you agree with that? Yes. Okay. So I think there is a way that Marvel could be doing the multiverse well. I don't like, well, I don't always like the whole fan service way that they do it. I mean, some, I, I don't know. <laughs> like, talking about, talking about, like, no, I mean, I love no way home and i am Mm -hmm. not gonna say too much sad about it (laughs) we do need to talk about no way home sometime because as much as i love it as much as i love it there are things that just should not and do not work and Mm. that's the topic for another time but go ahead i think i don't know i can kind of let that one go because it was just it was it was a great moment for fans in general and it's like if you if you're gonna shake your fist at that then that's that's your problem i guess i'd say more like in multiverse of madness especially with like john krasinski Mm -hmm. showing up as mr fantastic just kind of being cheap fan service and i assure you that was not cheap fan service that was a very expensive fan service of getting all those actors in the same room well in in terms in terms of writing (laughs) in terms of writing yes fan service not in production value i would say even like having captain carter there was just kind of cheap fan service too just kind Mm -hmm. of felt like they kind of felt like a random team to me like the actual team is much makes a lot more sense very much going on the side tangent right now i'm gonna get back on track it's okay i was gonna say marvel's problem right now everyone would agree is that they don't have a clear direction and even multiple multiverse stories are not working together Doctor Strange multiverse is very different than Loki multiverse. Yeah. 
And then you add into that the different realms of Thor's world, Mm -hmm. the different universes, like the micro universe of Quantumania and time travel, Mm -hmm. which Loki also isn't necessarily consistent on not not saying it's not consistent on but it's both time travel and alternate universes and maybe those are the same thing maybe alternate universe i mean that is okay i take that back the multiverse according to loki are is one sacred timeline that branch off into other timelines i'm processing this for the first time now how then did dr strange and the multiverse of madness visit other universes if there was supposed to only be one sacred timeline Unless that happened during Loki and, and all the branch timelines were going crazy. Well, Loki happens outside of time, so I don't know what any of this but the means. But the... No, no, no. The TVA exists outside of time, supposedly. Yeah, and most, so, if, so then most of the storyline of Loki would as well. The storyline of Loki, but not the concepts of the sacred timeline and branch timelines. So, presumably, if you have a branch timeline, which was introduced in Endgame, taking out one stone from the past, using it, and then bringing it back... That was introduced then. So then how are there multiple universes that not only Doctor Strange falls into, you know, that that one cool scene of actual madness that we got, but it actually lands in the universe where the Illuminati were. Was that one branch that eventually got pruned by the TVA or is this just not connected at all? I don't think it's meant to be that complex. I think they just don't have a clear vision of how it's supposed to work. That's what's been confusing in phase four and five of all these different variations through time travel, through different universes, through different multiverses, outside of time, at the end of time. I think it gets confusing and they need Mm. to get their crap together (laughs) to try and figure this out because it's getting out of control. Well, then you have the question, is an alternate timeline different than another universe? Yeah, exactly. Are there a bunch of like... Is there a sacred timeline in each universe that can branch off like that? Or I don't, I don't know how this Technically, works. Well, well, yeah, it's just weird because the whole point of Loki is that there's different variants. And that was shown not only through the character of Sylvie, but the little flashes of Loki being different people, soccer player, newscast, and, uh, whatever. Classic and, Loki and kid Loki and alligator Loki and all those two. Oh, yeah. And at the end of time, yeah, well, those guys were yep. those guys were pruned. I forgot about that. I should have watched season one <laughs> again. So, yeah, it's just not working well it's very confusing the rules of the universe are not set and that's one thing that you learn in in filmmaking is the you know the obviously the filmmaking classes that i took my animation degree that you set the rules for your world right away you can have a different world than ours you have to make that clear what are the rules and you have to adhere to those rules right now without the branding of marvel all of these could be separate stories and they would they might work It just doesn't work because all of Marvel is weirdly unaligned right now. It just seems like there's a lot of, like, lack of communication. And it's kind of weird how all of these multiverse projects, you know, like, start with some big multiverse crisis, but then it all gets resolved by the end of the project. It's like, aren't these supposed to be Mm -hmm. leading to a big multiverse crisis instead of us just getting multiverse crisis after multiverse crisis and just seeing all these get resolved? And then we see Kang just get beaten by ants in his first appearance. (laughs) just like what's going on here this is actually leading no one knows well it is because haven't you seen the post credit scene that has a cameo from someone from the x-men or that post credit scene where they just throw in a random celebrity (laughs) Styles or charlie's their own or whoever that guy was playing hercules supposedly all those are leading somewhere supposedly supposedly well some of them aren't even supposed to be leading to a a big conclusion like endgame was they're just leading to the sequel like i believe the hercules post credit scene was just to thor 5 i don't think he's gonna play a major role in any other movie besides thor 5 so it's again very confusing we're getting off topic we like to do this yeah we are we're coming back around i don't know about any other gripes that i have with loki so we can talk about the good stuff which you are all about (laughs) talking about the good stuff about marvel loki's character arc we have two we have two to talk about one of them is the one that we ended up in endgame well, Infinity at the War. beginning of Infinity War. Yep. Beginning of Infinity War, my bad. And then branching off in Endgame to the two seasons of Loki as the other character arc. Well, before we get into that, I want to say something a little controversial. I think that <laughs> Loki is at least tied... Well, I don't know if I want to say... Loki is close to being the best Marvel show. It is so close to Daredevil, in my opinion. Oh, okay, Daredevil? Yeah, Fair. Like, I mean... Is is Daredevil your number one for Marvel shows? Yes, but I would not necessarily include it just because it was Netflix and it was a different era. I think of Marvel shows as the launch of Disney Plus till now. 
Well, I mean, Loki. And I don't know that I would put category. another. Yeah, I don't know yeah. that there's another show that would top Loki from the no. Disney Plus originals. Not even close. I would <laughs> Not say, even close. I would say Moon Knight, probably the next one. Yes. Maybe. I mean, Wanda. I don't know. Decent too. They all have their pros and cons. Should Loki have even gotten his own TV show? A lot of people had a gripe about that, where. It's not necessarily bringing Loki back from the dead and mm-hmm. making his Infinity War sacrifice meaningless, but it is definitely milking the character and using Tom Hiddleston to his ultimate use. Yeah, I'm. I mean, I would say it was a great idea. I mean, especially with what we've seen with these two seasons of Loki and just how good they've been. I I think it was the best choice to bring him back like they did. I actually, as I, I my initial thought is no, don't bring back characters that have died. Like if we got a, an Iron Man spinoff bringing back RDJ for something, I, I'd be like, really? But this one kind of makes sense, especially with the video or the uh, interrogation scene with Mobius in the mm-hmm. first one. And then we revisit it in the second season. Oh, yeah. The first one shows the emotion of what Loki's path was after the first Avengers movie, because that's the Loki that goes that branches off. He all he knows is the Thor movie and the first Avengers movie. And then he doesn't know anything after that. He doesn't know Thor the Dark World, Thor Ragnarok, Infinity War. And that's the scenes that he sees of his what should have been his life if the Avengers hadn't messed around with that timeline. Mm -hmm. And he actually is sad in that moment to see that he failed at protecting his brother in Infinity War and Mm -hmm. died. And that causes an emotion that affects his choices for the next two seasons. One of the main complaints that I've heard about Loki is that they turn him into a hero too fast. Do you know what I'm talking about? And I think... Yeah, for sure. He didn't didn't do enough mischievous stuff. I mean, I think it's a lot better... Than Book of Boba Fett in that sense, because Book of Boba Fett just kind of went, he was a hero way too quick without any explanation. But if you watch that first episode of Loki again and see everything in that interrogation scene and knowing that his actions would lead to the death of his mother and then just seeing the rest of his timeline like that. And then in, I think it's episode three of season one, when he's just going through that loop with Lady Sif, with a combination Mm. of those two things, you know, both of those would really change your perspective on life. So while it may seem like he turned into Mm. a hero way too quickly, I think it makes more sense than most people realize. It also kind of subverted people's expectations because you would assume a show about Loki would be about him being the god of mischief, trying to get, trying to deceive people and and using his powers, however limited or infinite they are. And it's kind of turned into a detective story. So that lets some people down. But I also understand his character arc dramatically changed quicker in the Loki TV show arc than in the Infinity Saga arc. And that the one good thing I've I've heard from the haters, I follow a lot of haters. Maybe I shouldn't do that, but <laughs> the one good thing I've heard from the haters side is the one scene, I believe in episode two of season two, where he's not interrogating, but intimidating the one rogue guard or whatever. And he duplicates himself and uses his shadows to oh, restrain yeah. him. Those those moment that moment was cool. Brad kind of pushed him to be that got a mischief again not only with the alleyway scene when he's restraining him with shadows and duplicates of himself but also when he's interrogating brad in the in the prison cell to show that he's not messing around and brad drops the information that he needs but that was the loki that we liked from the infinity saga the cocky arrogant Mm -hmm. you don't mess with me kind of guy and i don't think the loki show gave enough of that but again, it comes back to how quickly his character arc turned into a sympathetic person. And and especially when it gets to the end of season two, when he's realizing the sacrifices that have to be made for whether it's the sake of his friends or he realizes that it's the timeline that he needs to be worried about. It's It turns into the sacrificial love that we are attracted to. There's also a major theme of glorious purpose throughout the whole of Loki's arc, both the Infinity Saga and the TV show. That is mm. Loki's point. That is his existence is glorious purpose and it's such an interesting topic to talk about because there are a lot of interesting points you could make from it but one specifically that i want to bring up and would highly encourage everyone to go listen to is a recent episode from the living waters podcast living waters is a great resource to talk about apologetics talking about your faith to people and some great commentary that they have they have over 200 episodes of of stuff that they talk about really well and in depth but one of their recent episodes that was weirdly timed and came out just in time for us to to talk about 
for this episode is purpose. The reason the, the episode I'm talking about is is titled "What It Means to Have Purpose in Life," and it talks about, for example, the the Catechism of what is the chief end of man. Basically, what is your purpose? It is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Our purpose is that that was something that a bunch of wise men decided on a couple hundred years ago, and ha- it is mostly accepted to be that is our purpose. Loki is obviously a fictitious character who's a little G God and he's trying to find his purpose. And I think his art from being a baby frost giant found by Odin and raised as a, as a prince and being the God of mischief because he can't find his, his way of life as a, as a higher being. And it's just so interesting. What do you, what, what are your thoughts? I think a big part of who, I mean, with trying to figure out who Loki is, you have to go back to Asgard. And I think his upbringing and everything like that. You know, he always grew up in Thor's shadow. Odin always compared him to Thor. You know, there's kind of a lot of that nature versus nurture kind of stuff going on. You know, on one side, he's got this skill set and powers that are more, they kind of lean more toward mischief and villainy. But then it was obvious that Odin also had a favorite child and that very much affected his relationship with Thor and I think, you know, in the first Thor movie, you've got that very powerful scene between Loki and Odin. The whole, like, I'm the monster that children, that parents tell their children about at night. That is such a powerful scene. Like, there, I was, so, have you heard of Cinema Therapy? They're a YouTube channel who do, like, these videos on characters and movies and stuff like that, and it's so good. Okay. You should link, I'll send you the video to that episode, and you can link it in the thing. But as they were talking about that scene about Loki, they were kind of saying, like, you know, they're wearing funny costumes, they're in a funny place, but yet this scene carries so much emotion, and, you know, that that and that scene a lot comes from Tom Hilson's performance in this scene, which is just phenomenal. But kind of mm. learning that revelation that that he's a frost giant really like answered a lot of questions in his mind it's like you know like why am i different and why am i all of this and it kind of helped him understood why he acted the way he did and then that you know caused a further rift in his relationship with his family and the and, you know he's always throughout this whole story he's looking for power and recognition and praise that's For, like, his whole arc from, like, Thor through Ragnarok, pretty much, it's just, like, that's what he wants. And then we see him in, well, still in the first Thor movie, when he, he's still trying to prove himself to his father, even, even after learning that he's a frost giant, you know, he's gonna completely wipe out Jotunheim for his father, and, you know, that's where he says the line. I could have done it, father! I could have done it! For you! No, Loki. And then we see Loki see that there's no place for him left on Asgard. But then he can't find any of that power, praise, and recognition on Asgard, so he looks for that in Earth, you know, through what Thanos has given him with the scepter, and then, you know, they go and steal the Tesseract. And, you know, he ultimately fails there. And then we ultimately see him fail in New York. And then in Thor The Dark World, you know, he's really got this full, in almost every movie, he's got this back and forth relationship with Thor, where he only really teams up with him when it's convenient. And then when it's more convenient with him to betray him, he'll betray him. And then he ultimately gets what he wants in the throne of Asgard at the end of the Dark World by disguising as Odin. And then in Ragnarok, we see him kind of as a, you know, it starts with Thor kind of forcing him to help him find Odin, and then Odin dies. And then they go on this great adventure with to stop Hela and all that. And I think what really changes his relationship with Thor is when Thor gets the upper hand on him in Ragnarok. You know that moment with the taser? That moment there where Thor gets the upper hand, I feel like had a big impact on Loki in a way, and just when Thor's all like, you're the god of mischief, but you can be so much more. Because Loki's conception of Thor for like almost the whole MCU has been that Thor's an idiot. So seeing kind of him finally take a take a jab at Loki like that and kind of show some mischief at his own, he kind of really started to see Thor as an equal in that sense. And I think that really helped him, even though he's very much in pain in that scene from being tased, I think... <laughs> 
I think that really helped Loki to see Thor in a new light. And that's kind of how it continues to go there. Yeah, I think the bigger picture for what you're getting at is Loki realizing love. He's so hostile to love. That's his character is he, he doesn't want to love anyone. He just wants to be on his own, do his thing. Don't let anyone else tell him what to do. And throughout the Thor trilogy, as far as the good ones are concerned, we don't talk about uh, Love and Thunder. But he realizes that his brother loves him, <laughs> even though he's a pain in the butt. Yeah. He loves him enough to, to spare his life, to help him get on the right track, and to be patient with him. And that really comes to a head in Ragnarok, especially <laughs> in goofy little scenes like Get Help and mm -hmm. leading into the tasing scene. He's just like, man, brothers are cool. Thor is not that bad. And that leads directly into Infinity War when he's he's mm -hmm. feeling all these emotions and suddenly that's ripped away from him because of Thanos. Throughout the whole MCU up until Infinity War, it was all about him. Even when he kind of like turns to a hero in Ragnarok, it's kind of still about the power and praise. You know, he's got that whole like, your savior is here moment <laughs> in Ragnarok. And you know, it's yeah. while he is doing... The right thing, it's still kind of for the wrong motivations, and it's kind of still all about him. But with that moment in Infinity War, he figures out that he loves Thor and his family more than his ego. Man, I gotta say, the opening scene to Infinity War was one of the mm. best ways to open that movie. It mm. led straight from Ragnarok into this big final thing that we were getting. And I remember Loki holding the Tesseract saying, the sun will shine on us again, brother. Like he knew what was about to happen because he, he had the knife. He was ready to, to make his move. And he knew that if he missed, he would cost him his life. And it did. And that was an emotional sacrifice. And you could see it in Thor. Like, yes, he had just been goofy in Ragnarok, but all that goofiness drained when he saw his brother die. And you could feel the heartbreak of, of Thor as he saw that. Man, the, the emotions were high at the end of Ragnarok. And that was the perfect setup for the Infinity mm -hmm. War opening scene. And talking about Tom Hilson's great performance again, when Loki's pretending to make that deal with Thanos, he says, Almighty Thanos, I, Loki, Prince of Asgard, Odin's son. It's like for the first time in his life, he's realizing who he is and what his purpose is in this story. But that's the old Loki, the old yeah. Loki, the, the, the original, original time Loki. sacred time Loki. Apparently, maybe we don't know anymore. Um, so yes, he finds his he finds his he realizes his purpose and his mm -hmm. identity as the child of his father through love of his brother. You can make that comparison of loving someone even though they're really a pain, and yet eventually they get it and they get who they're supposed to put their identity in. You would hope that's that, that you would lead them to Jesus and they're putting your identity in the father in the same way that Loki put his identity in being the son of the man who he called father for so long. Like that's finally, his hard heart was broken in that sacred time. But if you don't mind, we're going to move back to the TV show where it talks a lot more about the burden of glorious purpose because that Loki was the one that branched off from the first Avengers movie. He's so cocky at the beginning. He's still like, I am a god. You must treat me as such, realizing that he's not hot stuff anymore outside of time. And as we l meet more Lokis, especially in the Void, you realize that each Loki, the, the one thing that's consistent, even though they look different, act different, talk different, they all understand that they are burdened with glorious purpose. Mm. And that even with the classic Loki played by Hugh Grant, that's the, one of the last things he says when he's distracting the, the giant dragon cloud, which is weird saying that out loud. But yeah, he, he yells, glorious purpose or whatever. That was a pretty cool scene. It was. But all of them, all of the Loki variants understand that there's something bigger for them. And it's not mm -hmm. because they're just gods. It's not because they have power. There is something greater. And it for most of them, it's not doing something bad something evil it's actually doing something good and having that change of heart classic loki sacrifices himself for sylvie and our loki to distract Eliath and and makes that sacrifice play sylvie doesn't quite get that she's still the cocky loki who's trying to be the big shot in the story and loki's arc throughout these two seasons is him realizing that sacrifice play is what's needed by the end of season one, when he's talking to He Who Remains and realizes this whole thing's about to hit the ceiling fan, then he gets back to the TVA and is like, guys, we got to stop this. Why is he Why is he wanting to stop this? He should be the villain 
trying to encourage the death of the universe as long as he's in charge. And yet he's already feeling these emotions for the people he loves, whether it's Mobius or the other people on the timeline now. Most of the TVA, or some of the TVA, have affections for the sacred timeline and all the timeline. Like that's some of the moral conflict is we're just pruning these branches and killing these people. Now it's not really killing because it's going to the void at the end of time, but more or less killing. And Loki is like, we need to find the ultimate way to stop this, especially at closer to the end of season two, when you're realizing that the loom isn't going to work and the, the whole thing is going to explode soon. And again, spoiler alert, the end of season two is really good. Him sacrificing his time and his energy, literally his time. I thought that we would peak at time jumps when it said five years later in Endgame. Oh, no, yeah. <laughs> Loki gives you centuries later. Century. Like that was almost a cop out. But you can't do you can't show centuries like you get the point. He's spent centuries time looping back to learn more and more things that they could do right so he can find the perfect way to do it. And why is he doing this? It's because he loves his friends and he understands the value of all the people on the timeline that he was once a part of because he goes back to that interview room, that interrogation room with Mobius and he's talking about purpose. I, I'm realizing how good it is now. I, I knew it was good. It's yeah. even yeah, better. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> the sacrifice play and he's not unlike Captain America who we talked about two weeks ago who just understands the right way to do it or Tony Stark who we talked about many months ago where he just kind of gets the right way to do things but still is has this attitude Loki is learning the why throughout his TV show arc at least and I guess yeah and, and in the Infinity Saga one only it happens mostly in Ragnarok but it was leading up to that He's understanding the why of why all the heroes that he's been fighting or not been fighting the one he, the ones he fought in Avengers. He understands why they were right. And that's what makes him no longer a bad guy. Now he's still tend towards the mischief and the, the villain part of it, but I can't, stop thinking about that look he has on the throne where he's holding all of the strands of the timelines and he's almost sad not in a sad sad but in a happy sad where he understands the sacrifice he's made being the one on the throne holding everything together more or less he knows he's just sacrificed his life to sit there pretty much for eternity for people he doesn't know and that's again bringing it back to one of the whole reasons i started this podcast is because of hollywood heroes written by frank turk talking about how movies have a message and the ones that really resonate with us are the ones that have that sacrifice play. Now Loki's still alive outside of time, but he's holding those those timelines knowing he's never going to leave. I think it's a little cocky to say that I'm the one who's going to be in charge now. There's no one better to, than me. But he also gets it because he's t spent centuries living a bunch of different things, learning all these things and understanding what's best. And God just knows that from the get-go. Like our, our God, the one who's real, the one who has control of our one and only timeline, if you want to think of it like that, he's already all-knowing and he's perfect and good and sets the standard for good. Yeah, kind of going back a little bit, I think another one of the big reasons for Loki's change in the show is because he never had anyone ask him why before you mm. know while he was on asgard and everything he was just kind of labeled as the god of mischief so when anyone so when he he did anything mischievous just like oh that's because he's the god of mischief or whatever classic loki he killed a lot of people on earth it's just kind of because he's loki but in the first mm. episode of loki we see mobius go why do you like killing people? Why are you doing any of this? And I think that too, you know, is kind of one of the big reasons he takes this change in character. And it's almost kind of funny because we see Loki and Sylvie take these reflective arcs kind of with the TVA. You know, Sylvie started as like the only good Loki. She got mm. taken away because of that. And through the TVA, you know, she kind of started becoming more chaotic and vengeful. Well, with Loki, when he was came to the TVA, he had, like, just massacred New York. Pretty much. But then, yeah. But then, from his experience at the TVA, he gains purpose, and he understands that there's this world and this timeline, I guess, bigger mm. than himself. In the last episode, when Loki's finally back at that point in the interrogation through all the time loops, Mobius says, Most purpose is more burden than glory. Trust me, you never want to be the guy who avoids it because you can't live with the burden. How do you live with it? Scar tissue. I think he's... You no, know, Loki spent so much time just looking for glory, 
then he never found purpose. But now sitting on that throne, even though, I mean, with what he never actually wanted the throne, as you know, he says in the show, he just didn't want to be alone. And now he's willing to take the burden of being there alone, cursed on that throne because he's found his glorious purpose. He found the way to do it. Yeah. And it's not glorious. It's just what he was made for in the context of the story. I would say it's still kind of glorious. I would say it's not only because of the face he makes at the end. The sad, Mm. almost pleading, if there's any other way, almost the Jesus in Gethsemane of, Mm. I wish there was another way, but there's not. Well, I would say it's more like, in the big picture, glorious than glorious to him. But no one else knows about it except for the, the four people in the in the command center well they know i guess then the rest of the tva knows yeah i suppose but i think that ties into that interrogation room visit where he realizes it's not going to be glorious but it is his purpose one last thing about glorious purpose every single person has written on their heart a desire to be closer to their creator and Mm -hmm. some of them realize it some of them don't some of them ignore it that is our glorious purpose like that is that catechism i mentioned earlier of what is the chief end of man? What is our purpose? It is to glorify God and to thoroughly enjoy him forever. When we don't meet that, we feel empty. We have a God-sized hole in our heart. And having things fill that hole will never be enough. And God is the only thing that can fill that God-sized hole. And I don't think enough people know that. And that's our job to try and make that known. That our glorious purpose is not going to be glorious in this life. But when we become a new creation here on this earth, and when then we become glorified in heaven, that is the glorious part of the purpose. But our purpose right now is to know God and thoroughly enjoy him forever. That's my Amen. little twist on the Loki story and how we can learn from it. Because we got to learn from these movies, man. Why are we watching him if we're not learning from him? <laughs> Speaking of that, I am going to be doing an episode soon on why we believe what we believe here on the in the, the One-Eyed Team, I think is what we call ourselves. The One-Eyed Team and what we believe. I did that in episode zero way back when, almost a year ago. We're going to be celebrating our one-year anniversary soon, which is crazy, which I think we'll have a big announcement for that. Stay tuned. But I'm going to be doing a What We Believe episode soon and our theology on movies. But that's all the time we have for today. Remember, kids, God made you special. He loves you very much. No, uh, thank you guys so much for listening. Have a great rest of your day. Know that you are loved. God bless. But make sure to follow our socials and and stay tuned next week because we're going to have some great stuff coming up. Oh, yeah. What is it? It's uh, what is it? Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, we Facebook. Facebook? There, no, I don't. We think are Facebook. no one. Else, no one follows us there. But on make Facebook? that change. Wow, we're we on are Facebook. only because Instagram uh, is owned by Facebook. So oh. yeah, follow us all there. Share this with your friends, and make sure to come back next week for another interesting episode on something you will find out only if you are joining our Discord or follow our bum, Instagram bum, because bum. that's the only place you'll find out early. Keep it a mystery. Know that you are loved. God bless. Good morning. Uh, and if I don't see you, <laughs> good afternoon, good evening, and good night. There you go.